Hi, my name is Tony Craig. Uh, I'm an Associate Professor in the International Studies and History Department here at Staffordshire University. Uh, and I would like to uh, talk to you today uh, uh, about the context and the history of uh, uh, international propaganda and election interference in the aftermath of the 2016 US election and the controversy surrounding uh, the potential of Russian interference in that election. Uh, what I'm here to kind of talk about is to try and contextualize and to try and uh, almost normalize a uh, discussion of international propaganda as a, a tool of uh, the, the state, a foreign policy tool of the state uh, that is actually more normal uh, than uh, much of the kind of uh, 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 media coverage of the uh, uh, Russian interference in the American elections has uh, made it out to be. So I've got a, lot, a number of examples uh, to, 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 to look at, both uh, recent and historical. Um, but I'd like to start first with the uh, election of Donald Trump in 2016. Now, the allegations surrounding the 2016 US presidential election are that Russian intelligence somehow worked to promote fake news stories and pro-Trump uh, opinions on social media in the months prior to the uh, election. These included uh, uh, leaking various scandals, promoting various ideas uh, and, and linking Trump to uh, uh, different communities uh, on social media uh, in the United States that, with the object of you know, getting them, these communities, to vote uh, in, in greater numbers for Donald Trump. Certainly, uh, the evidence suggests that uh, uh, there, you know, the Russian Internet Research Agency, a, a Russian government-funded organization based in these offices, the, this office building in St. Petersburg, uh, contains uh, has the capability to uh, 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 spend money on, and develop arguments and present uh, uh, geographically targeted adverts uh, on social media, creating stories that uh, would be uh, attractive to particular groups in the United States. Uh, there's also evidence that this uh, 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 Russian internet research art, uh, agency spent a hundred thousand uh, dollars through Facebook alone uh, in the run-up to the US presidential election and there's some uh, information uh, as to how they conducted those campaigns uh, using both trolls and bots as well as comedy photographs uh, 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 that would, uh, that, that, that would uh, go viral uh, online. What we know about uh, what was going on, and what we don't know, and what we can't know, uh, are, are three different kind of areas uh, that, that uh, in certainly in my intelligence studies uh, uh, courses that I present at, the, at this uh, both at undergraduate and postgraduate level, uh, we look at in quite some detail. Certainly, the Russian government uh, looked like it's, it preferred a Trump presidency over a Clinton presidency, uh, particularly uh, with regard to uh, Trump's. Uh, position on foreign policy, um, uh, and there's also definitely evidence that then, you know that hundred thousand dollars is evidence that social media manipulation was occurring, uh, was being funded by the Russian government. Uh, also, the Democratic Party computers were hacked uh, in the summer of 2016, and uh, emails uh, were leaked to the press from that collection uh, that had been hacked. And the suspicion is that uh, the Russian government were behind this. Certainly they were behind promoting the leaked emails once they were released. Uh, as for known unknowns, um, we have uh, a situation where uh, we know that Donald Trump had uh, links uh, with the Russian government through intermediaries. Um, we don't know what was said uh, in those meetings and in those leaks uh, in, in 2016 and earlier. Uh, certainly there was a planned uh, Moscow Trump Tower, um, although the negotiations uh, for that ended on the day that the Democratic National Committee hacks were first reported. Um, yeah, we can uh, build suspicions of that or actually confirm that uh, Trump cut links as soon as he realized that uh, these things were happening, uh, depending on your viewpoint. Um, and that officials from the uh, Russian government attempted to make contact with the Trump administration in waiting and early in government. Well, you know, again, you could call that suspicious or you could say that every government uh, in the world was trying to contact the Trump administration in waiting after it was elected, as well as early in government. 
So what we don't know uh, 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 and have no proof of is whether these active measures uh, actually affected the election result. We can't really ever tell what makes one person vote for one political party over another. It's not an instance of one piece of uh, kind of messaging actually being the kind of golden ticket to win someone's vote. Often there's lots and lots of different sources, uh, social media, uh, has millions of different voices all trying to uh, get your attention. What makes one more appealing than another is very is impossible, in fact, to tell. Um, and we don't know, and probably will never know, whether Trump knew that his team was making the contacts they were uh, uh, for the ends that some people suspect they were. Um, we also don't know what the Russian government sought to gain uh, from contacts after Trump's election. Uh, if they were happy that, for example, that his foreign policy would go a particular direction, what are they looking to gain after his election? Just confirmation of that. Uh, it's uh, very, it's you know, in fact, impossible to tell unless you actually spoke to the people and they told you the truth about what they were uh, uh, looking to do and trying to achieve. So what was the purpose? Uh, what were the foreseen effects of Russian interference uh, in the US uh, election? Um, what were the intentions of the Russian government? Well, if, Firstly, you can certainly say that they intended um, to aid the election of Donald Trump. Uh, he was their preferred candidate and he was making better noises, uh, uh, more preferential noises to the Russians uh, 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 that would hopefully lead to better relations should he be elected. Uh, the US, as well as uh, other countries, had sanctions uh, and have sanctions against Russia um, with regard to their, as punishment with regard to their uh, intervention in Ukraine uh, and elsewhere. Uh, NATO's expansion into the Baltic states um, and NATO's interests in Afghanistan and Central Asia um, uh, generally mean that uh, relations between uh, the West and Russia have been pretty poor uh, and getting worse over the last number of years. So the hope, generally speaking, uh, was that Russia would somehow improve relations with the US if Trump were elected. However, there's also a, another kind of a way of looking at um, uh, election interference in particular by a foreign state uh, in that destabilizing public opinion, making people think that every Trump supporter is pro-Russian or that uh, 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 is, is a way of uh, destabilizing the democracy, um, you know, polarizing society, getting people to fight against each other, rather than seeing that their kind of true adversary is actually a, an overseas government who uh, have solely their own ends uh, and, and, idea, and goals that they want to achieve uh, that have no relation to the uh, US president who, who sits as president or, or, or at all. Um, previously in the Cold War, we, uh, we, we often talk about the concept of plausible deniability in covert action. Um, but in fact, if you look at the attempts of Russia uh, 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 through this election interference, through this propaganda to actually destabilize the United States, we're actually talking about not plausible deniability um, uh, at all. We're talking about the idea that Russia wants people to know that they have this capability, that they're doing these kinds of projects um, so that they're, they become more fearful and more aware uh, of Russia's uh, existence and Russia's uh, claims in the world. And certainly uh, all of this uh, falls into uh, uh, Russian and previous, previously Soviet uh, kind of active measures and ways of doing uh, this kind of uh, covert propaganda work. Uh, in the Cold War, um, this kind of uh, covert action was known as uh, active measures by the uh, Soviet Union, uh, conducted largely by the uh, KGB. Uh, and it included uh, compromising materials, uh, uh, blackmail material, the production of, uh, in order to uh, gain uh, uh, informants within foreign governments. Uh, we've got people like John Vassell, the British civil servant, um, who spied for the Soviet Union for a period as a result of blackmail material that was provided by the KGB. Uh, provocative material, disinformation, propaganda. Uh, back in the 1980s, the, uh, the, the US government um, uh, was blamed by Soviet propaganda for the creation of the AIDS virus, for example. Uh, uh, the, the slogan, uh, Reagan means war, was one that was promoted by the KGB in the United States in the 1980 uh, US election. Um, 
uh, as well as the promotion, there's evidence that the promotion of various conspiracy theories regarding the JFK assassination actually have the hands of uh, 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 Soviet intelligence uh, behind them. The idea, again, is to destabilize public opinion, to uh, pull people apart in the United States, uh, to uh, destabilize democracy as a result. Uh, the Soviets have also used leaks before as well, uh, as early as 1917, when this, you know, the Sykes-Picot Agreement uh, 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 was, was first published in Pravda, later taken on by the Guardian, um, by the Bolsheviks, trying to demonstrate uh, Western duplicity uh, in, in their affairs with the rest of the world. The Sykes-Picot Agreement uh, carves up the Middle East um, uh, uh, prior to the end of the First World War and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it's an agreement between Britain and France and uh, that, that would kind of uh, make the, 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 the Middle East part of their if, you know, informal empire in, in, in many respects. So in some respects you can see this particularly the uh, provocative behavior and the leaking material uh, uh, as, as tactics that the uh, uh, Soviets uh, had a long history of um, uh, doing. Uh, the uh, current leader of Russia, of course, Vladimir Putin, has a background in the KGB and is well aware of the, uh, its history and uh, what it can do and what it does uh, and what works in the world. Um, and certainly, so if you look at it like this, you can see that the move to social media trolling, the fake accounts, the use of bots, this provocative cartoonish uh, uh, propaganda material, from you know evidence in the Ukraine from 2014, you can see it in the U.S. election in 2016, um, and it's something that they can do, and and, and it's, it's a shift to do the same thing just by different means, modern uh, uh, kind of means of doing it. Now, America isn't alone uh, in being subject to and being a democracy subject to. Um, uh, uh, political propaganda by foreign countries and Britain also has uh, a long history of uh, uh, election interference or at least the support of political groups within the United Kingdom by foreign governments. Uh, the British Union of Fascists, uh, their leader Oswald Mosley uh, uh, and his wife Diana Mosley were personal friends of uh, uh, senior members of the Nazi party. Um, uh, Adolf Hitler for example uh, attended their, 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 their wedding um, and they were subject to MI5 surveillance uh, from the uh, mid to late 1930s um, because they were a domestic political party. They are therefore subject to uh, uh, the, you know, the freedoms of all domestic political parties. Everyone's entitled to their beliefs in a democracy, of course. Um, but MI5 uh, identified that the uh, funding streams coming to the BUF that looked like they were coming um, uh, from Nazi Germany uh, via Mussolini's Italy. Mosley and others, uh, the surveillance on them indicated that they were a potential threat to Britain uh, in the early months and years of the Second World War and were in fact imprisoned without trial, uh, without uh, kind of criminal charges ever being brought uh, against them. So they were interned without trial uh, for these uh, uh, for a number of years, the early years of the Second World War. And certainly there's evidence that uh, the BUF was, uh, uh, did contain fifth columnists. Um, William Joyce, who although he had left the BUF by the time the war broke out, he actually flees to Nazi Germany um, fairly early on in the war and uh, reports for service uh, to the Nazis, uh, where he becomes the voice of uh, Germany, Germany calling, Germany calling, known as Lord Haw Haw. Uh, this kind of political interference in Britain is not something that Britain does not reciprocate in. And in fact, Britain has a long history of participating um, in uh, 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 propagandizing and uh, uh, manipulation of public opinion uh, elsewhere in the world. Now, the Zimmerman telegram of 1917 um, broadcast, you know, it was, uh, uh, it was a real message. It was uh, a coded message uh, sent from Germany to Mexico basically promising for Mexico that in the event of a German victory in the First World War, and um, if America had been involved in that war and Mexico came on Germany's side, well then uh, Mexico would be allowed uh, to have its territory, uh, the old Mexican territory uh, in south, the southwest of the United States returned to it. Uh, this was um, your territory that had been given up uh, after the uh, uh, Mexican-American War uh, uh, back in the 1860s 
uh, this, uh, you know, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, um, uh, and basically meant that Mexico still had a claim, uh, and this claim would be fulfilled uh, to Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California. Huge amounts of territory uh, uh, that would come under uh, the Mexican government's rule uh, if they were to back Germany. The British, Sig British Signals Intelligence uh, 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 decoded and translated this message. And rather than keeping it to themselves, they decided to give it to the New York Times uh, and to President Woodrow Wilson. Um, this was you know, a major coup for British signals intelligence, uh, and it was something that they you know, arguably could, should have kept to their chest in order to protect the source because they were clearly reading uh, German diplomatic codes, but it was considered to be far too important. Um, and it did have a huge uh, uh, kind of impact on uh, American public opinion particularly with regard to uh, which side they should, you know, they should take in the First World War. At this point, point, of course, they're neutral. It only takes a few more months. It takes the, uh, the Germans to make a mistake of uh, 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 declaring, un, uh, 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 declaring uh, 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 warfare against uh, American shipping in the Atlantic Ocean uh, for uh, American opinion to you know, shipped entirely, uh, but the effect is there. They're being, they've been softened up uh, significantly by the Zimmerman telegram. Now, the Zimmerman telegram, the, the benefit of the Zimmerman telegram was that it was true. Um, but uh, in the Second World War, when, you know, uh, prior to America joining uh, the, uh, the Allies and, and Britain in their uh, fight, uh, you know, the, the current fight against Germany, um, they began to invent um, stories uh, similar to the Zimmerman telegram uh, and give them to, again, the, uh, the, the, the press in New York uh, to run with. Um, William Stevenson, a so-called quiet Canadian, a businessman working on behalf of Winston Churchill uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in the Rockefeller Plaza in New York, um, he established a, a, an organization known as British Security Coordination, which had links with the FBI, it had links with the president, it had links with American intelligence, um, but it also su uh, uh, supplied America, the American press uh, with stories that you know, were designed to put fear and, uh, and distrust of Germany into uh, American public consciousness. Uh, which included this uh, fake news story, uh, the, the forged German plan for South America that was uh, published in the autumn of 1941. So bef again, before uh, America joined uh, the war with the uh, following the attack on Pearl Harbor. In the Cold War, um, you know, Britain did not stop uh, propagandizing uh, and established uh, in the 1950s uh, at the Foreign Office, a, an organization known as the Information Research Department. The, uh, the idea was that uh, the Soviets were you know, spending money uh, on uh, 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 funding communist parties all over the world, communist newspapers, uh, pushing stories that uh, made them look much better than they actually were, and that uh, Britain uh, needed to somehow counter these stories and counter these allegations, particularly in its empire, but often, you know, throughout the world uh, uh, in order to stop the kind of the, the, the march of Soviet communism. So they've got, uh, they, they develop a fairly soft uh, 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 but clandestine um, and secretive uh, uh, propaganda service in the information research department. They uh, recruit foreign journalists, they pay them to conduct investigations, they feed them with uh, their own information as and when they have it, uh, the, uh, they publish uh, anti-Soviet uh, documents, I think a quarter of a million copies of um, uh, uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm were distributed behind the Iron Curtain by the IRD in this period. Um, according to John Peck, a former head of the IRD and a close associate of Winston Churchill in the war, uh, the role of the IRD was to drive a wedge between the hardcore of Stalinist communists and those on the non-communist left, uh, basically to give the left uh, and the kind of moderate left uh, a, a psychological boost uh, with uh, uh, comforting stories, with things that kind of bolstered their view, so as not so so as to promote kind of social democracy, Christian demo Christian democratic kind of movements, as opposed to uh, uh, communist uh, and Soviet-inspired movements and to kind of stop the, the march of communism uh, uh, around the world. 
but you know, British the, the, the IRD is a foreign office uh, institution. Um, MI6 certainly had a more covert uh, kind of approach to uh, propagandizing, um, far more akin to the, uh, uh, the the British Security Corporation happening in America in the, in the 1940s, the early 1940s. Uh, with released materials, uh, fairly op uh, yeah, re recently declassified materials, um, uh, historians have identified uh, 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 an MI6 slush fund that was used um, so that money would go would not be taken from the books of MI6, um, but could be spent on propaganda uh, in places where Britain felt it necessary uh, that its influence should be kind of um, more broadly supported by you know local people. So you've got things like £60,000 spent in the 1950s on anti nasser propaganda in Egypt, uh, uh, another operation where a pro-Western Lebanese leader is supported by £50,000 worth of uh, uh, propaganda funding, um, £200,000 um, uh, uh, spent on numerous operations against Nasser uh, following the failed uh, Suez uh, invasion in 1956. Uh, you've also got money being spent in Syria. You've got money being spent in places that we don't know about. Um, likely the money that they were spending here was uh, American money left over at the end of the Second World War uh, uh, by the uh, special operations executive the, 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 to, to kind of prop up MI6 uh, operations um, now that Britain was out of the war but, but broke. We can still see uh, this happening today. Uh, the UK uh, does conduct strategic communications operations overseas. Uh, from September 2015, in the aftermath of the, uh, the Commons vote against military action in Syria, uh, uh, the UK government felt that it was necessary to be seen to be doing something in Syria. And whilst you know, special forces were sent in surreptitiously, um, there is also a, a fairly major, you know, sort of it's not a small amount of money, £10 million uh, pounds a year, uh, being spent on communications uh, uh, inside Syria, trying to promote uh, basically Britain's interest in the uh, Syrian civil war. Now, you might think that there isn't much of a Britain, British interest in the Syrian civil war, um, but certainly Britain has always kind of come out against the dictatorship of uh, Assad and uh, the Ba'athist regime there. Uh, and they're uh, uh, absolutely concerned and rightfully so about the rise of ISIS as well. So this money has been spent on by uh, employing PR companies, uh, both in Britain and overseas, uh, who then employ uh, local freelance journalists and uh, small kind of uh, groups of uh, journalists inside Syria to go off and go out there and to find stories uh, that they can promote both in the Syrian domestic press regionally uh, within the, the Middle East itself and globally uh, that have these anti-ISIS and as well as anti-Assad messages. Um, you know, they, 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 these, these included you know, a foreign office, a foreign and commonwealth office organization known as the counter Daesh communications cell, as well as uh, organizations, two organizations run by the Ministry of Defense and a broad umbrella organization known as the Conflict Security and Stability Fund. So the UK government is still doing this. This may not be election interference, but it's certainly covert um, uh, 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 action against the uh, perceived enemy overseas. Um, the United States, of course, has been uh, doing this kind of stuff as well. Uh, and in the United States, the uh, this this kind of propaganda comes in under its definition of covert action. Um, which includes, you know, at the extreme end, paramilitary regime change, assassinations, those kinds of things, um, uh, with propaganda kind of being at the lowest end of uh, 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 overseas covert interference. Um, Harry Truman, I think, put it best, you know, the reasoning behind the use of covert action to, when he said it is hardly an exaggeration to say that the policy of averting a third world war may depend on the strength and effectiveness of our efforts in the field of psychological warfare. You know, it's it's one of these things. If you haven't tried it, how do you know it doesn't work? Uh, 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 and if you don't try it, you know, uh, won't you be and, and war does come won't you be always left with that lingering doubt that maybe it could have been averted uh, if only you had tried everything uh, in your wherewithal to uh, to avoid it so there's a certain um you know skewed morality about uh, uh, this kind of propaganda 
uh, and uh, a, a sense of, well, we'll try it and see if it works and we'll, we'll, we'll look at it again at some other point. Uh, for James Barry, um, uh, quoting here the Doolittle Committee, uh, this is the, uh, the, the, the justification by General Doolittle of uh, covert action and wider forms of covert action, not just propaganda. Um, he puts it very starkly. He says that it is now clear we are facing an implacable enemy in the Soviets whose avowed objective is world domination by whatever means and whatever cost. There are no rules in such a game. Hitherto acceptable norms of human conduct do not apply. If the United States is to survive, long-standing American concepts of fair play must be reconsidered. We must develop our espionage and counter-espionage services and must learn to subvert, sabotage and destroy our enemies by more clever, more sophisticated means than those used against us. The, uh, the, 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 yeah, the idea of covert action, therefore, is kind of takes off uh, uh, in America in the 1950s with uh, the propaganda uh, element of covert action being there, but not necessarily and at different points being more prominent than at other points and being used in different circumstances. This is from the CIA's own records, which indicates uh, their analysis of the success or otherwise of their various covert operations between 1947 and 1975. And you can see at the top line, these are the successful political or propaganda uh, efforts. Uh, so there are successes for uh, that promote di di democracy inside a dictatorship, that promote democracy against anti-democratic elements of, of a country, that um, uh, uh, there's propaganda that promotes uh, pro-US elements resisting dictatorship, as well as removing elected leaders to replace them with dem democratic elements, as well as, in the most extreme example, uh, removing uh, elected, popularly supported leaders and replacing them with pro-US elements, with no indication whether they're democratic or not. Um, so there's lots and lots of uh, successful, as well as uh, a, a, a number of uh, unsuccessful uh, political or propaganda operations that are mounted by the CIA. Uh, they were unsuccessful uh, in Cuba. There's a project that's unsuccessful in Vietnam and, and an unsuccessful project in Indonesia. Uh, but there's some successes, successes uh, in uh, with Radio Free Europe, a propaganda service broadcasting into the uh, 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 the uh, uh, the Eastern Bloc. Uh, it's still around today. You can listen to it. It's on it's online. Radio Free Europe. Just Google it. Um, They've also got successful successes in Italy and in France and in the Philippines. Um, uh, I'm going to look at a few of these examples and kind of tease out a few ideas from them. So British Guyana is a particularly curious uh, area. It's part of the British Empire um, uh, and therefore it's governed uh, uh, from London. It has, uh, in the Second World War, its economy was bolstered by uh, its uh, uh, aluminium ore and its, its mining capabilities. It's famous, of course, for sugar, uh, is where you get Demerara sugar from and so on. Um, and uh, in the 1950s, uh, its population was kind of divided in, into three thirds, uh, a, a broadly um, a black Caribbean population and indo guyan uh, Guyanian uh, population, which are uh, kind of descendants of indentured workers brought in from India in the 19th century, as well as a kind of a, 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 a white population as well. Um, the Indo-Guyanese and the uh, Black Guyanese population uh, uh, united in the 1950s behind the People's Progressive Party and campaigned uh, for independence. Uh, the PPP had a fairly radical social program, but you know lots of countries had that, but Britain had the NHS, for example. Um, and uh, Britain uh, hoped to grant full independence uh, to whoever was in power there, as long as they were democratic, they didn't mind so much, uh, in the early 1960s. The PPP were led by this man, Chetty Jagan, um, along with his wife, Janet Jagan, um, uh, with a, 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 a kind of further down the leadership kind of spectrum, uh, Forbes Burnham. Um, this, uh, the, the, the Americans figured that, uh, were first to figure that uh, Chetty Jagan and Janet Jagan, Janet was an American herself, uh, may be communist kind of stooges and fronts, uh, and that if Britain were to grant British Guyana uh, independence, um, then British Guyana would very quickly become a, 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 a communist state in South America, and that's something that the Americans did not want. Um, in the early 1950s, you know, the, the uh, 
uh, the Britain responded to these early kind of concerns by the Americans by uh, shutting down the constitution and the uh, uh, the Parliament of British Guyana and investigating uh, significantly investigating. You know, they they raided their offices, they raided their homes, uh, the PPP. MI5 uh, were involved uh, aiding the local special branch, uh, desperately trying to find evidence of communist leaks. Now there were communist links. There were some links between Janet Jagan and the Communist Party of Great Britain, but there's very few um, uh, and no direct links uh, with the Soviet Union at all were found. Uh, and so the gradually the constitution was reinstated, reforms and kind of uh, moves toward independence were continued, albeit at a slightly slower pace. Uh, but it was still hoped that British Guyana would get its independence in the 1960s. Uh, but in 1961, following the failure of the uh, Bay of Pigs invasion uh, uh, by the United States uh, and the CIA, um, the US began to block British plans and stalled the independence of British Guyana. Um, in February 1962, Dean Rusk, the US Secretary of State, wrote to uh, the Foreign Secretary in Britain, Alec Douglas Hume, and said, it is not possible for us to put up with an independent British Guyana under Jagan. Uh, Hume uh, responded to Rusk, uh, replied to Rusk uh, by saying, how do you suggest that this can be done in a democracy? Uh, well, um, so for 1962-1963 and into 1964, the CIA funded uh, a split along racial lines of the, 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 the PPP, um, propagandising against the Jagans and in support of the, uh, 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 the, the uh, Forbes Burnham. Uh, they also funded uh, the world's longest uh, general strike, uh, where largely black workers were uh, in British Guyana. Uh, rose up against the 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 the, the, uh, the state and this included uh, uh, the, the the Jagans in order to again promote Forbes Burnham uh, as the kind of the, the black liberation uh, leader. Um, in 1966, therefore, uh, after a series of elections, a split within the PPP, dividing it uh, along these uh, racial lines, it was Forbes Burnham and not Chetty Jagan uh, uh, who uh, led Guyana. Uh, to independence. It was Forbes Burnham who um, stayed in power, um, albeit uh, corruptly, for the next 20-25 years. In Chile, uh, the stories of the Allende government um, uh, and its fortunes were uh, thoroughly dependent on CIA funding uh, through the 1960s and into the 1970s. Uh, and this, and you know, the, the Chilean experience is similar to uh, experiences uh, right across South America in the 1960s, 70s, and into the 1980s. Um, operation Condor uh, was a CIA operation in which training and support was given to right-wing dictatorships all across uh, Central and South America, from Argentina through Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, Bolivia. Um, and some of these regimes that were funded by the American government were uh, uh, murderously harsh uh, on opposition. Um, it's a, a estimated that between 70, 1975 and 1985, up to 35,000 people were killed or otherwise disappeared uh, in uh, 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 these right-wing dictatorships supported by the American government. Um, culminating, you know, the, 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 the issue of the, you know, the, the murder of uh, Archbishop Oscar Romero in March 1980 in the cathedral in El Salvador. Uh, the first murder of a, uh, a, a Catholic Archbishop since uh, St. Thomas of Becket uh, in, uh, in the 12th century uh, was you know, absolutely horrifying to uh, huge amounts of uh, world opinion. Oscar Romero, um, the murderers of Oscar Romero were not Americans, but they were trained by Americans as part of this Operation Condor um, uh, uh, happening in the 1970s. Um, and he's since been uh, kind of uh, 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 he's since been made a saint by the Catholic Church. The long-term effects of this kind of covert action um, the, 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 the are can be profound. Certainly, uh, when the British and the Americans, uh, MI6 and the CIA, used uh, propaganda to oust the uh, to feed a, a, an insurrection that eventually ousted the uh, elected Prime Minister uh, uh, Mossadegh um, from Iran in 1952. Uh, 
they replaced him with uh, a puppet in the person of the Shah of Persia and the Shah of Iran. Uh, he was far more pliable, but uh, also had, you know, a, a secret police, a so-called savak, that would uh, that 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 terrified the local population and uh, you know shut down all opposition to his rule. Uh, and this kind of concentrated opposition and concentrated hatred uh, uh, toward the West when it became apparent that this had been a British and American-backed project. So much so that in 1979, the Iranian Revolution didn't look anything like uh, uh, Dr. Mossadegh and his nationalizing of the Anglo-Iranian oil company. It looked like something far, far worse uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the Ayatollahs and the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Islamic dictatorship of Iran. The anti-Western feeling uh, within the Iranian government continues to this day. Nothing truer was said by President Nixon than uh, uh, when the president done it, that means it's not illegal when it comes to, especially when it comes to international propaganda. You know, the, the, the president is uh, uh, absolutely within his rights uh, to use these kinds of methodologies overseas. There's nothing against, uh, against doing it uh, under domestic law. Where it becomes illegal is when it happens uh, by other states in one's own country. Uh, so Nixon is absolutely right when he says this, but he's completely wrong if he were to go to one of the countries that they were actually active in. The issue of legality and illegality, morality and immorality and ethics and the lack of uh, in these kinds of uh, propaganda projects uh, boils down to uh, I think what James Wolseley of the uh, CIA uh, said back in the 1970s, that the United States must retain the capability to do something in between sending in the Marines and sending in former President Carter. You know, uh, it has to have something in between uh, military force and humanitarian action. Um, and it's this idea that uh, 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 that some good could come out of covert action. Uh, 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 you know, uh, that, that, that good could be affected upon the world by uh, 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 this kind of political interference, that one trusts one's own kind of set of ideological principles as being true and good um, uh, uh, is something that lies behind many of the justifications uh, of this kind of work in the world. But for a former US Defense Secretary, uh, the opposite view uh, is also uh, apparent. You know, what right does the US have barging into other people's countries, buying newspapers, handing out money to opposition parties, or supporting a candidate for this office or that. Doesn't democracy have a right uh, to work itself out in, uh, in its own areas? What right does the US have to work it out for other people? But overall, uh, you know, what this lecture hopefully has shown is that there's little tactically new in Russian interference in the US election. And it's not just Russia who do who does this kind of thing, uh, but you know, plenty of countries are involved in it, and e including this country, including to this day. The only issue is when Trump becomes complicit in Putin's uh, uh, campaign of interference. That's when it becomes illegal, uh, and that's when it becomes most dangerous, of course. Uh, social media, I would argue, and wider online media offer only new methods of deploying uh, rather old techniques. Um, and uh, as we've seen with Syria, uh, new efforts uh, are being made by Western governments to the whole, uh, the whole period of the global war on terror included uh, websites, YouTube videos, uh, social media communities uh, funded uh, by Western governments that would that, 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 um, uh, 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 countered terrorist messages uh, and messaging and propagandized pro-Western values. Um, as the uh, SNTT.me was saying no to terrorism. Uh, dot Middle East uh, was a, a CIA-backed uh, uh, project like that. So according to US figures, this kind of interference in politics, according to that table between 1947 and 1975, uh, has a 62% success rate. Um, so 62% of the time, it doesn't make things worse. Um, now, if you went to a doctor and said that he had a treatment uh, that would have a 62% success rate, you might not take it. But if it was non-invasive, it will, if it if it you know, if it didn't have any risks associated with it, then you know, and and, and the alternative was something uh, terrible, then you might take it. Uh, 
you might at least try it. Uh, the issue is that, uh, for me anyway, is, the, is that the 62% success rate belies the fact uh, that there, there is risk involved, the risk in inter to international reputation, the risk to uh, uh, the long-term damage uh, to a country uh, by participating uh, in interfering with other, in, in other people's business uh, is something that uh, isn't something that the Russian government particularly care about. In fact, it's beneficial from them. But it is something that Western governments need to take much more cognizance, cognizance of. Thanks. Thank you for watching and uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk today. Uh, if you'd like to know more about uh, what we do in the Department of International Studies and History, uh, the courses we offer uh, both at BA and MA level, um, don't hesitate uh, uh, to go on our website. Uh, uh, you, can, you can just Google it, International Studies and History at Stafford University, we'll get you there. Uh, we also have a Facebook page uh, where we keep in touch with uh, our current students, our alumni and anyone uh, interested in kind of uh, 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 keeping up with us, uh, as well as a Twitter feed, uh, Staffs Uni Hippo, at Staffs Uni Hippo is the uh, Twitter feed. Uh, we also have a student research journal if you want to read um, some of the kind of products of uh, uh, research within the uh, department. Um, that's uh, mostly undergraduate, we include some postgraduate research as well. Uh, it's called Set in Clay and it's accessible via the, our Facebook page, facebook.com slash set in clay. Uh, it gets put together every year uh, by the uh, students at Stafford University and uh, another one should be out uh, 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 early in the summer. Uh, so take care, thanks for watching and goodbye.